welcome to Radiant Church. My name is Andrew. I'm the lead pastor. We're so glad you could join us today from wherever you're watching or listening from. If this is your first time joining us, hey, go to RadiantChurchSC.com. Click I'm new. We fill out that short form online for us as a way of saying thank you. We're going to donate $5 to one of the nonprofits that's listed. Last time, we jumped into one of the most famous stories that Jesus tells called the prodigal son. And we're going to take a couple more weeks to walk through some aspects of this story. And we started learning how both sons, the older brother and the younger brother, they were both lost. So often when the story is told, the focus is on the younger brother, on the father's extravagant love and forgiveness to bring him back home. And that's not wrong, by the way. That's, that's a very powerful takeaway in and of itself. But there's more to the story. And we learned that Jesus was directing the story to the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, who did all the right things for God. They didn't have much of a blemish on their record. They were people with high morals. Uh, but that's actually really the problem. See, like sin isn't just breaking the rules, as we talked about. Sin is also putting yourself in the place of God. And what can easily happen to so many of us, Christians included, is they take pride in their good works for God, and their high morals, and their obedience to God. And what can happen if that occurs is we can become our own savior and we can seek to leverage some control over God. We feel like he owes us because after all, we've done so much for him, right? You know, we're living the right way. He has to come through for us because of what we've been doing. <laughs> well, Jesus sends a pretty powerful message by including the self-righteous and prideful older brother in this story. But there's more because by including this flawed older brother in the third and final story in Luke 15, he's actually set the stage for us to talk about what the right course of action for this older brother should have been. Who is the true older brother? Now, we're not going to revisit the prodigal son in its entirety in this teaching or the next one. You can read this story again in its entirety in Luke chapter 15. But the reason that Jesus gives this story and the two other ones that come before it, the lost sheep and the lost coin, are because he's accused of constantly connecting with sinners. Yes, those people, right? He's eating with the people who are far from God. He's hanging out at their houses. He's, he's being kind to them. And it riles up the re religious crowd. So in Luke chapter 19, he keeps doing the exact same thing. He hadn't really changed. And this time he's in a city called Jericho and he befriends a notorious tax collector named Zacchaeus. And you know, well, you guessed that he roused up the, the Pharisees again by insisting he be a guest in Zacchaeus' home. What Jesus says in Luke 19.10 is very pivotal because it broadly defines why he came. Luke 19.10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Man, Jesus came to bring you home. So whether you've wandered far from God like the younger brother or you spent years working hard, doing the right thing, filling your heart with a sense of moral pride, man, you are lost. All of us have been there. Some of us are still there. So how do you experience a change? How do you find your way maybe again for a second time if you've wandered off? Well, you need a few key pieces. And first, you need God's love. God's love is not static. In fact, God is the one who initiates love towards us. Look at what the father does in this story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, verse number 20. So he, this is the younger brother here, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, and filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, and he embraced him, and he kissed him. I mentioned this last time. But the fact that, you know, the father saw the younger brother coming uh, makes you wonder. Did he look for a son every day? You know, I mean, as a father myself, I know I'd be out there every single day. I'd be looking for my son. I would not go in for the night without making sure I had one last look on the horizon, hoping today might be the day that my kid comes home. And when this younger brother does appear, you know, the father doesn't wait for him. He sprints. He runs as fast as he can to see his son and to welcome him home again. It's not the younger brother's remorse or repentance which initiates initiates this love. It's actually the father's own incredible love that he has for his son, which does. And when you have somebody who, who shows that much love for you, it makes it a lot easier to admit you were wrong, right? To show remorse and to ask for forgiveness 
from the person that you've harmed. But it's not just love for the younger brother. The father also loves the older brother as well. And, and we see him be the one to, again, initiate this love when the older brother comes onto the scene. Look at verse 28 of our story. The older brother, well, he was angry and he wouldn't go in. This is the party we're talking about. So his father came out and begged him. He's pleading with him. So even though the older brother is resentful, the father still shows love. And so what Jesus is painting here, he's, he's painting a picture of his own love for the religious folks, for the Pharisees and the crowd, whom he knows that will soon hand him over to the Romans to be crucified, right? The older brother, he doesn't get like a talking to, he's not chewed out. Instead, he receives a loving plea to turn from his anger and to come home and join the celebration. I think what's most impressive about this interaction is that Jesus is not a Pharisee to the Pharisees. Man, it'd be right to be, but he's not. He, he loves the wild living, free-spirited younger brother as well as the hardened religious older brother. Sometimes, you know, God initiates his love in a very dramatic way that produces a strong sense of his presence, like the father sprinting towards the younger brother. But other times, you know, God's he's, he's patient, he's quieter, even pleading with us to accept his love, to come home again, even though we're insistent on going our own way like this older brother was. There's no chance of us finding our way home, though, to God the Father without his love taking that first step. I love what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans. Romans 5, 8 says this, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. Boy, that phrase, while we were still sinners, while we were still far from home, we're a long ways off, and yet God took the first step, and he initiated that love first by sending Jesus. It's something that Christ himself talks about in John, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. In other words, how God loved you and me. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now look at verse 17. It's very important. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, okay, but to save the world through him. And that's why Jesus, even though he would be very justified to act this way, it's why he's not a Pharisee to the Pharisees. God not only took the first steps to initiate love towards us, but he does so without judging us. God is not trying to punish you. He's not trying to make your life miserable. One day, judgment's going to come, but that day is not today. God deeply loves you, and he loved you first. Without that love, you can't find your way back home. It's God's love which searches for us. It's God's love that calls out to us. It's His love that moves His Spirit to draw us back home. Staying in John for a moment, listen to what Jesus says about the role of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse number 8. When He, it's the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He's going to convict the world, this is you, of its sin, of God's righteousness, and the coming judgment. Talking about eternity right here. So that pulling that you feel towards God, that feeling of, you know, something just isn't quite right. I don't think I'm living the right way like I should. I, I don't think I believe the, the right things. It's not really adding up here. That is God's Spirit convicting you, drawing you to the heart of God the Father. And the action that we take when we encounter God's love, that's called repentance. Now, what is repentance, okay? We don't use that word too much outside of church circles. What is that? It's not, it's not getting out your laundry list of sins, okay, and asking God to forgive you for each one. If it was, the older brother wouldn't be lost, right? Remember, he tells the father he's never disobeyed him. What Jesus is showing with the older brother is, is pretty close to a person who's almost faultless from a moralistic point of view. So how does somebody like the older brother, who seems to have it all together, who looks the part, how does that person, who, who's also lost, find Jesus. Seems impossible when you consider it, right? Well, part of the point with the older brother is showing how distracting it can be to focus on sinful behaviors and shortcomings. The Pharisees and the religious, they thought that, hey, if you would just externally, on the outward appearance, right, if you were morally good, if all your actions were good, if you're living the right way, you were okay. And, and when you did sin, as long as you show remorse and penance, penance is key, uh, then, then, hey, that's okay too, because this is your self-salvation project, right? And they didn't get to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is this. The older brother had a prideful lifestyle. 
is comparing his self-image to his achievements and his performance. Again, hence that, like, I've never disobeyed you mantra he has. You cannot simply state your wrongs and do works to compensate for them. That's actually not true repentance. Repentance is a transformation in how you think. It's changing how you live. So the religious repent of their sins, and then they kind of go their own way, do their own thing. But Christians are to repent and allow Christ to change them, to tear away the root cause of their sins, which comes back to this desire to really be your own savior in the first place. We have to admit that, hey, we, we, we've put our hope and our trust in things other than God, that in both our wrongs and rightful actions, we've been seeking to place ourselves in the driver's seat. Jesus is not your co-pilot, okay? I don't care what the bumper sticker says. He is your pilot. You're the passenger along for the ride, wherever he takes you, because he and not you is in control. And when you realize that the antidote to being you know, bad isn't actually being good, then you're moving in the right direction because you're seeing that the root cause of sin is, is personal pride, is a desire to be your own God. And that will make all the difference because it will change how you relate to God. It will change how you relate to yourself and to others and to the world, to your workplace, even to your own sins. You know what that's called? It's called being born again. It's called that for a reason, because this shift is a radically different way to live and see the world. We need God's love to bring us to repentance, but we can still can't find our way home. You know, that one key important piece, and that piece is sacrifice. At the start of Luke 15, where the prodigal story is found, the Pharisees and the religious are really upset with Jesus, man. We, we talked about this already, but he's hanging out with sinners. They don't like it. He's living out his mission from Luke 19.10. He's seeking and saving those who are lost. They don't like it. So he gives three stories, three stories in response to all the religious and moral outrage. The first one is about a lost sheep. The second one's about a lost coin. And in both stories, somebody goes searching for what's missing. And in both stories, there's a celebration at the end because of you know, what was missing is now found. Now, if you're listening in the crowd, as somebody you know, would be, as Jesus is telling the story, especially with the third story, you're probably already certain where he's going to go with this third one, right? Something's going to get lost. Someone's going to search for it. It's going to get found. We're all going to party. It's going to be great. But the twist in the prodigal is that nobody go searching for the younger brother. Now, by placing these three stories close together, literally one after the other, Jesus is intentionally asking this question, who should have gone out and searched for the younger brother? Now, he knew the Bible. He knew it really well. John chapter 1 tells us that he was the Word of God in human form, right? So he knows story after story. He knows everything in, in, in the Scriptures. And he knows one important story about two brothers that his audience would have known, too. And it stems from the first book of the Bible called Genesis. It involves brothers named Cain and Abel. Cain murders his brother, and it prompts God to tell Cain, Yeah, buddy, you are, in fact, your brother's keeper. There's a legendary story, and it's legendary because we don't know how much of it is true, but we do know to a certain extent it is true, that involves two brothers in the Vietnam War. The younger brother goes missing in the jungles of Vietnam, and there's no official channel of communication that can confirm his whereabouts or what's happened to him. And so the older brother, when he hears about it, flies to Vietnam at the risk of his own life, and he searches for his younger brother. And it's said that despite the dangers, he was never harmed because both sides in the conflict heard of the story, showed great respect and admiration, and, and he was just simply known as the brother. Well, that's precisely what the older brother should have done in this story. It's what a true older brother would do. Hey, Dad, my younger brother, he has been a fool. He's ruined his life, but I'm going to go get him. And I'm going to bring him home. And I'm going to do this with my own expense. I risk my own life because he's my brother, because I love him. You know, when the father tells the older brother, everything I have is yours, he's telling the literal truth here. Like in, in dividing up the estate and handing out the inheritance, the father's got nothing left. The ring, the robe, the fattened calf, they're actually not his. They belong to the older brother at this point. The younger brother's welcome back. And he's welcome back at no expense because the father says, man, you don't have to make restitution. Don't worry about that. But this homecoming, it's not exactly free. If somebody breaks a lamp in your home, it's going to cost, right? I mean, you can forgive the person who broke the lamp and say, ah, you know what, it's no big deal, it's just a lamp, and then send them on their way. But you're going to have to be the one that goes out and pays for a new lamp, right? It's not actually truly free 
Forgiveness itself is not actually free. We often think it is, but it costs something. It always comes at a cost for the one who's doing the forgiving. The younger brother's forgiveness cost the older brother because someone had to pay. The younger brother wasn't welcome back home again for nothing. There was a price that had to be paid. The tragedy in the story, as Jesus tells it, is that there is not a true older brother who risks it all and searches for his lost younger brother until you know, he finds him and brings him home again. The younger brother in the story, unfortunately, he has a religious Pharisee as his older brother. But we don't, right? We don't. We, we have Jesus, man. We, we need a brother who doesn't just go to the next country to find us and bring us home. We need one who will move heaven and earth for us. We, we need a brother who is willing to pay a finite amount of money at the infinite cost of his life to bring us home again. We, we've all rebelled against God. Whether you're a younger brother, whether you're an older brother, we deserve to be cut off. We deserve to be kept outside, to be isolated for eternity. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother who steps in for us. The point of the prodigal son? Well, forgiveness involves a price. Someone has to pay. And there's no way for the lost sons to return home again unless someone bears the cost themselves. Our true older brother is Jesus who paid that price in our place. He was stripped of his robe so we could be clothed with dignity we don't deserve. He was treated as an outcast so we could be brought into God's family by his grace. He drank the cup of eternal justice so we could have the cup of the Father's joy. There was no other way for God the Father to bring us back home at the expense of our true older brother. It had to happen that way. It had to happen at the expense of Jesus Christ. He had all the power in the world. He saw us enslaved to the very things we thought could free us. And so as Philippians 2 details, he gave up his divine privileges to become like us. He laid aside his glory and his power at the cost of his own life, and he paid the debt for our sins by purchasing for us the only place our hearts could ever find love and rest in our Father's house. When you come to this realization, man, it'll wreck you. It'll change you from the inside out. It's this selfless love for God and for others which destroys the mistrust that we once had for God himself, a mistrust that makes us either a younger brother or an older brother. John Newton, he's the the author of Amazing Grace. Many of us know that song. But he also wrote another hymn. It's called We, We Were Once As You Are. And in it he says, Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we've seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. You know, the choice that so many of us believe that we have is either, you know, to turn from God and pursue our own interests, like the younger brother, or repress our desires to do, you know, our moral duty and follow God like the older brother. But the love of Jesus changes that because when we see the beauty of what Christ did for us, it attracts us to him. It eradicates our fears. It frees our hearts. We will never stop living as younger, older brothers until we acknowledge our need for Jesus to be our Savior and to accept what the work of our true older brother accomplished for us. We pray for you today. Father, we love you. Thank you for those who are watching and listening. Lord, I thank you that we have a friend who sticks closer than a brother, that we have a true older brother who went searching. We were lost couldn't find our way back home. Love of God drew near to us, drew us back. Holy Spirit convicted us. Draw us, God, to repentance. And Lord, it was the sacrifice of your son that allowed us to come home. Forgiveness doesn't cost you know, us anything, but it cost you your son. Our ticket to eternal life and freedom with you wasn't actually free. It did cost something. Thank you for paying that cost for us. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. If you're listening or watching right now, you say, Pastor, I'm hearing all that. I just, I do not, I, I think I'm lost. I'm like that younger brother. I'm just, I, I, I don't want to be lost. I didn't know someone paid this for me. Can it, I, I want to I, I make this right. What do I do? Well, simply invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Just say a prayer kind of like this. I'm going to model it for you. Just say it like this. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. God, forgive me, man. Cleanse me of the wrongs that I've done. I've violated your standards. I know that I'm lost. 
Save me from my sins. Save me from my wrongs. Right the ship in my life. And Lord, from this day forward, I, I'm not going to call the shots anymore. I'm not going to do my own thing. But God, I want to follow and serve you. I want you to lead me, and I want you to guide me. Will you be Lord of my life? I want to serve you. And if you said that prayer, you're in the kingdom of God here today. Lord, I thank you again for your son. May we emulate that example. May we be the true older brother that searches for those who are lost, that brings those folks back home in your kingdom and to your family. Lord, may we risk it. Uh, God, may we, may we pay the price for forgiveness, knowing, Lord, that in doing so, we're bringing lost younger brothers, lost older brothers, back home to you. Thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for what you're going to do. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, man, look, if you pray to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, congratulations. You're in the kingdom of God. Your prayer is not a one-stop shop. Your journey is just beginning. There's more to it, okay? So do us a favor. Go to RadiantChurchSC.com. Click Share Your Story. We would love to hear what God's done in your life. We'd love to hear, you know, how God has touched you and impacted you, uh, that you've said yes to Jesus even, because we can help you with what your next steps should be. Have an amazing rest of the day, wherever you're watching or listening from. And we're going to see you again here next time. Jesus Christ who calls the dead to life.